Welcome back to Home Experience. This is the second part of the discussion on the word repentance. And specifically, last week, we were dealing with this idea of repentance in the kingdom of God that Jesus would teach on two things, a lot of things. I mean, he said it multiple times. I think we said 135 times this repent because the kingdom is near, this idea of the kingdom and repentance. Pastor Greg started with the kingdom and then I picked up, I picked up where the word repentance uh, is this idea, this key to actually enter into the kingdom of God. So for those who are lost in this dying world, that they have an opportunity to choose the kingdom of God, to repent, to turn from one thing and choose something else. With that turning is this idea of godly sorrow, that we have broken God's law, that there's this deep cut to the heart, repentance, and then what were we supposed to do with that? What do we do with that? And that's to choose the kingdom of God. So on the other side of actually entering into the kingdom of God because of what Jesus has done for us, do we kind of get rid of the word repentance or does it stick with us? And I wanted to share with you today that the, this idea of repentance sticks with us even in the kingdom of God, this turning from our wicked ways towards God. I'm continuing in that same idea because this concept of repentance from sin really kind of never uh, never leaves us because we're, we're in this world. But greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. See, I had this... Uh, opportunity, right, several weeks ago, to kind of read through the book of 1 John and to kind of, you know, have a time of quiet. And I get to the chapter 5, verse 18, and I get uh, problems, man. I'm, I'm stuck on this verse, uh, so much so that I even call Pastor Greg and I'm like, look, look, is, what does this really mean? Let me let me share this this scripture with you and kind of let's unpack it a little bit so we can understand how repentance fits into God's kingdom. Because really that's what kind of precipitated these two talks is this like wrestling with what the Bible was saying. And um, let's just go into it real quick. So in 1 John chapter 5, verse 18, I'm using the NIV translation. It says, We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who is born of God keeps them safe, and the evil one cannot harm them. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true by being in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. All right, look at verse 18. It says, the first part, we know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. I kind of set me into a tailspin because I'm like, wait a minute, hold on. Anyone born of God does not know, does not continue to sin. So I went to other translations and yes, other translations kind of helped me out, began to under, help me understand this. So I called Pastor Greg and I was like, is this like a translation error? What's up with this? And it's not a translation error, it's, it's this idea that not continuing in sin is this not having a habitual sin, this, this uh, unrepentant sin, this um, moving away from God to the world. That, so this understanding of now that we are citizens of God's kingdom, we act as citizens of his kingdom that we don't want to go far away because the Holy Spirit is dwelling in, inside of us that when we are born again, we're born of God, that the Spirit will not allow us to go that much farther out. He will constantly bring us back, uh, back to the Father. And that's how we can overcome sin. That's how we can understand this, what's going on in our sinful nature. That, and Paul talks about all the time, like the things that I want to do, I don't want to do, and the things I don't want to do, I do anyways. This, this wrestling that we're, we're in, that the Holy Spirit is living and dwelling inside of us, will help us, will keep us from habitual sin. So if you look further into verse 19, it says, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Well, that is true, that we are children of God. We are citizens of this kingdom and we are looking at the world and its decay and it's falling apart. 
And this idea of this new bloodline that we're in, this, um, this new family that we've been born into, the family of God, gives us this, not only this citizenship, but this new identity in Christ. That when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin, our depravity, all of the things that we've done wrong. He sees his son and that the blood of his son covers us and makes us white as snow, as in the Old Testament uh, poetic writers would say. So this now we're thinking as a citizen of the kingdom of God. Now, let me ask you, did you wake up this morning and go, yep, I am a citizen of the kingdom of God today? Probably not. You probably woke up and probably tried to get slowly moving, but that is who you are. You are a citizen of the kingdom of God if you are born again, if you are born of God. And God keeps those whom he loves safe, and the evil one cannot harm them. Now, in verse 20, you continue further, and it says, we know also that the Son of God has come, which is, which is true, which is the gospel, and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. All right, so this idea of knowing him. Now, I think I might have used this example before, but my son um, really, really likes Kevin Durant. He's a basketball player. He knows a lot about him. My oldest son knows a lot about him, he loves basketball. He knows all these things about him, all the stats. He knows where he comes from. He knows a lot of things. But if he were to meet Kevin Durant for the first time, Kevin Durant would not know him. My son would know him, but Kevin wouldn't know him because they've actually never met. See, my son knows about him, but he has never actually been truly introduced to him. This letter of John, John is saying that I not only knew about him, I knew him. I leaned on his breast, as what the, the, the Bible says, that he saw him with his own eyes. He lived life with him. And you fast forward to Peter and John, who are being brought before the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin, these, these religious leaders, they, these, they're saying to themselves that these men are unlearned men. How is it that they know these deep things? They know these deep things because they had been with Jesus. See, repentance draws us to the feet of Jesus himself. It allows us to come into the throne room. It's not because of what we've done, it's because of what Jesus has done, and our identity is now in Christ. So the righteousness, his righteousness, has been given to us. It's this beautiful illustration, it's this beautiful idea of adoption, of being brought into this new bloodline, of knowing God, not only knowing about him, but knowing him Personally. That's why we're always pointing you in the direction of the four S's of this idea of creating solitude for yourself and silence and scripture and Sabbath. This solitude is following the way of Christ, of going away, going to be alone with the Father, get away from the world, pushing the world away and engaging with the Father. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking is that many of you have been dogged by temptation and by sin for your entire Christian life that there are things that are habitual that happen in your life that you have not been able to overcome. And I want to remind you of whose you are and that you are God's child, that he is the one who is working in you actively. He's the one who's drawing this new life. He wants you to have new life. This repentance idea is for you to repent of those things and turn towards God which you probably have done a lot, but here's what might be missing. I know that it was missing in my life and I had habitual things that kept on coming up and coming and re recurring in my, in my life, is that I didn't create healthy boundaries. See, the Holy Spirit wants to use me, but he also wants to use me and to make wise choices. So I have to choose to make wise choices in my life. Now, if you look through the book of Proverbs, you'll see, and I tell my kids this all the time, you don't want to be foolish. Don't be foolish. Set up safeguards for yourself, whether that's on the computer or if that's in other relationships. You have to be wise. You have to use wisdom in this world because this world is trying to pull you down. Satan is using a lot of different mechanisms that he has created over the centuries, and he's very good at it, to deceive you. Do not be deceived, but be wise. How are we wise? Is to sit with Christ, to lay our hearts out before him and to say, it's all yours. I have open hands. I'm working not because I have to, because I want to, and I'm giving this all to you, Lord. 
This is something that is in your heart. As, as a citizen of the kingdom of God, you can actually enter into this continued relationship with God. But also asking the Lord, what is the source? What is the, the real root issue of this temptation that you have? Because the activity that you're performing is kind of a symptom. And if you just try to cure the symptom, that's one thing. But if you ask God for a new heart, to change your heart and to reveal what it is that you are really struggling with, he will show it to you because he will lead you into all truth. I believe that. I believe that that is true. Now, let me remind you of what it says in Colossians 3, verse 1. It says, therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, that we are to seek things that are above, not below, to keep our minds right, to protect our, our minds. We are to protect our thought process. I know that I've read, I've had this experience myself where I have these self-deprecating thoughts, these, these negative thoughts in my mind. I have to take those captive in my mind and I have to replace them with something or replace them with the truth that God has given me. I'm replacing with them with my identity. I'm replacing them with what the Bible says. Proverbs 4, 23 says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. See, we're an ambassador of God. We speak on God's behalf, not because we have our own message, but we have his message that we are demonstrating to the world. There are things that you have encountered. There are things that you have experienced that I could never speak into and to give, to minister to the hearts of someone else. You are unique in what you have experienced and you are unique specifically in what you have endured. And God and his, his amazing sovereignty and his amazing economics, he can take all those bad things and convert them into a currency that he can use for his glory. And he wants to use those things for his glory. But will you choose to do so? If you find yourself caught in sin and caught in deep things, repent now. Turn away from those things and turn towards God. You will not regret that decision. Just like you didn't, will not regret the, res, the decision that you have made to repent and to turn to God initially in the first place. Because you know, and deep in your soul, deep in your heart, regardless of what's going on, that God has a better way, that he brings life. He brings confidence. He brings courage. It's because of his spirit that's living and dwelling inside of you that you can live the life that you want to live, not only for eternity, but for right now, because he's with you and that he's encouraging you. And that is my message to you today, that this idea of repentance when you're in God's kingdom does not go away. It is, stays with you as we battle through the things of life, but you are not doing it by yourself. God is with you. Remember, Jesus said, I am with you until the very end of the age. That he gave us a counselor. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He gave us someone to live and dwell inside of us. Allow us, so I'm asking you to choose to allow the Holy Spirit to live in your life and to manifest himself in others' lives. But you can't do that if you're not right with the Lord. It's your relationship with him first. And if you're noticing that your relationship with other people is kind of messed up, it's more than likely because your relationship with God has some static, has some things that are going on, some things that you're not allowing him to remove from your heart. If you allow that, God, allow God to move and to purify you from the inside out, you'll see amazing things. So I wanna encourage you with that today, that repentance is still part of God's kingdom, even though you are born again and I choose I choose for myself, I choose the way of the Lord, and I want to encourage you to do the same. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to know you, to make you known. For those that are struggling with sin, Lord, those are struggling with things that are, that are deep in their hearts and deep in their minds, whether it's with family, parents, bosses, friends, girlfriends, boyfriends, husbands, wives, children, whatever. Lord, that we would lay them bare before you and when we would come to you, and you, we would have open hands and to be ready and willing to do whatever you ask for us to do. But we know that when you do ask us to do something, you ask us to do with love and with grace and with mercy and all of those things that you give us to equip us to be able to walk through this world, to walk through this life, that we are not alone, that you are always with us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Thank you so much for joining joining me for this, this walk about repentance. You'll have some discussion questions to discuss with your group. Enjoy your time together, and remember to always give God the glory. We'll see you soon.